it's so good to be back on YouTube and all thanks to you because my DMs on Instagram and LinkedIn have been flooded with your questions and you know what I can feel your panic because in the last few months there has been just so many changes in the UK visa so Mayuri to your rescue today I have invited UK government approved visa and immigration consultant who is going to clear all our doubts finally so let's welcome adam oxboro all the way from uk let's go hi thank you so much adam for joining all the way from uk today it's a pleasure to be here Mayuri. thank you for inviting me to chat today all my pleasure because as you would have already guessed and noticed yourself that there has been just so much of panic and confusion around international students in the uk wondering what is going to happen next so adam here's a disclaimer i have a lot of questions for you from the students and from the community <laughs> <laughs> so, I get ready. 100%. So what say, shall we just start with the first question? Yeah, absolutely. Let's roll on through. Let's do it. All right. Okay. So the first question is, how can a student switch from a student visa to a skilled worker visa? Yeah. So a student will need to secure a job offer from a licensed employer. So every company that wants to hire an international student needs to get a license. Now, the rules changed recently. So basically, you can only change at a maximum of three months before the end of your course or once you've completed your course. Your employer will need to give you a certificate of sponsorship and then you'll need to make a visa application to switch to the skilled worker route. OK, so that's three months before the course ended. That's the earliest that you can possibly switch. Yes. OK, all right. So to switch from student visa to skilled worker visa, how long does the application process take? Yeah. So first, your employer needs to assign the COS. So they need to take your basic details like your ID, your current home address. And if you're a student, uh, you'll need to show them that you're either finishing your course within the three months or that you've already finished. Once you've got that certificate of sponsorship, you'll take the information from that and put it on your visa application. You'll apply for a visa online, and then you'd submit your application, pay the visa fee, pay the health charge, and book your biometrics. So anytime three months before the course end date that has been mentioned on the CAS of the student. That's right. It's either the CAS end date or if you've received anything official in writing from the immigration department at your university notifying you that they have notified the home office and that your new end date has changed. Oh, OK. Yeah. And this is especially applicable for master students who may have an optional placement who decide not to do the placement, but the course end date is indicative of the placement so then they need to get the notification that they're not doing the placement in order for that to be valid in order to bring the date forward makes sense and do you think it is realistic in 2024 for an international student to get a skilled worker visa well it seems like the government are certainly making it harder aren't they so a lot of students have been concerned a lot of companies have been concerned. Now, the salary is going up. The general salary is going up to 38700 Now, the one thing um, that will enable students to be able to continue to pursue careers in the UK is something called the new entrant route. So that's something that can give a bit of flexibility. So the salary does not have to be as high as the 38700 because many graduate jobs, as you would understand, would not be that amount. So can you please emphasize us more on what exactly is the new entrant route and what are the new salary thresholds? That's a great question. So we're going to find out when the general salary threshold comes up to 38,700. We're waiting to find out whether all of the codes across the board are going to be raised up relative to that raised threshold. But with the new entrant route, you need to be paid equal or above the three following factors, okay? So above £10.75 an hour, £20,960 per year, and 70% of the going rate for your role. So now when it comes to the technical language, it's not talking about the threshold, it's talking about the going rate for your role. So as long as it's equal or above all of those three, then, then you can qualify as a new entrant. 
So if we have to think of a ballpark number of majority of the courses or the careers, what would be that ballpark range be just to get an idea in pounds? So with the new entrant, the new entrant rules at the moment, before the rule changes, before any more announcements from the government, the average is, is sort of, I'm seeing a lot of new entrant applications in the 20,000 region in the mid 20,000. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things like engineers or tech professionals, there's flexibility there for them to be able to pay, be paid slightly less for a short period of time. Now, one thing I'd like to add is that there's a time window involved with the new entrant route. So that window begins either when you start your skilled worker visa, when you switch from the student, or when you start your graduate visa. And that window is four years. It's four years that you can be classed as a new entrant. So basically, when it comes to assigning a certificate of sponsorship, people have to be very careful to set their work end date exactly four years ahead, either from the start of the skilled worker visa or the start of the graduate visa, depending on when they switch. That's interesting. So does this also include the people who are already experienced or is the new entrant has a threshold on the age of the students? There's not necessarily an age threshold. There's a number of categories and you only have to tick one of those categories. This is a popular misconception because sometimes people think they have to meet all of the categories, but that's not true. So one category is you're under 26. Okay. A separate category is you're a recent student or graduate. The third one is that you're undergoing some sort of professional training. So for example, if you're working towards certification, maybe in accounting or engineering, uh, just a couple of examples there. Okay, that was quite explicit. So no matter if someone is a mature student, let's say 35 year plus, but they are just now doing their MBA. So they are essentially a new graduate. According to the rules, yes. Even if someone was 40 years old and had a number of years of work, according to the rules, if they're a recent student or graduate, then they can be classed as a new entrant. Now, it's quite confusing because new entrant does sound like, oh, well, they're a new entrant to the job market. So they're just yes. fresh, fresh out of university or fresh out of school. But that's not correct. There are very specific conditions, which we've just discussed, to be new, trend, new entrant. I'm glad we clarified this because this is, I think, one of the most common misconceptions that even I had, uh, I agree. <laughs> yeah, and it's a very popular question. Every day I'm getting people asking for clarity about new entrant. Every day. So many questions. So it's good that we can talk about it. 100%. So I have a follow up question on that. So for the new entrant, is this also applicable for the students who are currently in the UK or who have already switched to graduate visa or it is only applicable for the incoming May or September students? So the new entrant rule is is available for people right now if they're switching from the graduate visa now and it will be available as far as i'm aware once the rule changes there will still be a form of a new entrant route what i was talking about earlier about the salaries is you've got the general salary threshold here and if you look at the job codes on the government website there's 260 codes now a lot of those codes they don't even meet the 26,200. so when the general salary threshold goes up there's a chance although this is not confirmed that the general going rates for the other roles will go up maybe 10 or 20 percent but that's just speculation that's not confirmed but what that means is if that is true then with the new entrant rule that will mean that there might be less slightly less flexibility in terms of the discount in salary moving forward but we're still waiting for news from the government regarding that and you're saying that it would be very much dependent on the industry and the role as well. Yes, um, absolutely. So under that theory, they would all raise a certain percentage relative to the new threshold. Oof, uh, when when do we think we, <laughs> we would get a you know update to these speculations? Hopefully soon. Really, the, to be honest with you, the communication has not been very good, if I'm honest with you, from the government side. You've had some very drastic announcements coming from Parliament, and you've had a lot of people scrambling and stressing 
including myself, trying to figure out what's going to happen. <laughs> so um, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly when we'd find out. I would certainly hope it's soon because the, obviously the planned salary hike is going to happen in April. So it would be nice if we had some further clarity really from now so we we can at least start to plan makes sense so adam sponsorship has been such a buzzword lately in the uk so i want to understand what is the sponsorship cost for a employer and for b the applicant themselves do they need to incur any charges yeah so in terms of an employer there's a different set of costs depending on whether a company is small or large. Now, a large company is normally subject to audit under the Companies Act 2006. So shout out to any auditors out there who are listening. Now, that means that your revenue is over 10 million, your assets are over 5 million, and you've got over 50 employees. So we're talking about very big companies here. So with a large company, it's £1,476 to apply for a sponsorship license. That's the government fee. If they wanted somebody like myself to assist, I would charge £2,000 for a large company to become licensed. And with a small company, it's £536 to become licensed and £1,500 from me if you wanted my help, basically. So that's step one. Once you get the license, then of course you will have the ability to assign a certificate of sponsorship. Now, the costs for the certificate of sponsorship are £239 for each certificate. So you just need one certificate um, for your visa application. Mm -hmm. And then your employer will pay in what's called an immigration skills charge. Now, this is different depending on whether your company is small or large. So for a small company, it's £364 per year um, for each year that you're sponsored, and that's paid up front. So it's just under one pound per day. And for a large company, it's 1,000 pounds per 12 month period. So what you would do is you take your COS fee, 239 pounds. You take whether you're a small company or a large company, so 364 or 1,000, and you'd multiply that by the amount of years that you're going to be sponsored. And that will be paid up front by your employer. So that's really important. A lot of people, and I understand the reasoning why, would be willing to help cover the costs for their employer. Now, the employer should not really be passing any costs to the employee. They, the employee should not be paying for the immigration skills charge or the COS. And if it gets found out, then the company can can lose their license and then of course the individual loses their visa so those those are the costs that generally are covered by the company and then in mm -hmm. terms of the individual generally speaking a visa cost for up three years is around 744 pounds mm -hmm. and then for over three years it's around 1400 now the health charge has also gone up recently so that's now 1035 pounds per year and you'd multiply that by the amount of years that your visa is going to be okay so i have two follow-up questions so how long would the sponsorship be would it be for three years four or five years and who decides that so ultimately the employer decides that now i obviously a lot of employers may have a conversation with their employee to discuss the you know what the best way forward is but generally ultimately it is decided by the employer the company so adam from the numbers that you have shared what it actually cost to the company like 1476 uh, pounds for especially companies with millions of turnover this number doesn't sound too big of a number so correct me if i'm wrong what is the fuzz around employers not willing to sponsor international students giving the cost as a reason yeah i mean that's that's a really interesting question. I mean, like you've you've correctly pointed out, a company that's turning over more than 10 million can very easily afford £1,476. And also, with such a size company, they have their own in-house HR. They've probably, you know, they've already got their corporate lawyers. They've got their, you know, external advisors on certain certain issues to do with employment. And so it's it's baffling as to why why companies would choose not to do it. Perhaps, I think in some cases it's liability. So companies are already under so much, you know, there's, there are so many risks or so many threats to their company. And so perhaps they are reticent to want to be, to sponsor because they want they don't want that added layer of responsibility or added layer of risk um, when it comes to 
when it comes to the license. So if that's the case, let's say I have gotten a job, but they are just not ready to sponsor me. So how do I negotiate with my employer to consider giving me a sponsorship? I mean, the one thing is, if you've already got your foot in the door, if you've already, if you're already employed at a particular company, then of course, you've spent an amount of time there. They've already spent money in training you. Um, and you've already gained valuable skills that make you a valuable asset to the company in terms of your role and those skills and those um that experience will only just compound over time so oftentimes it can be more expensive for an employer to replace you than to pay the cost in order to keep you but what if i am just interviewing i have not you know actually worked at their firm and we are in the interview round is there anything that I can do to make them consider the sponsorship route for me? I think breaking down the costs, getting as much knowledge about the process as possible, being confident in that. What I've always found helpful is, even though the cost is up front, breaking it down in terms of what is it quarter by quarter? What is it per year? What is it per month? Like I said, the immigration skills charge is just under one pound a day for a sponsored employee. So it's things like that that make these big costs you know seem a lot more achievable so things like that i think being as educated as possible so you can go in with confidence you know there's other provisions as well so for example if someone is on a student visa and they do manage to secure sponsorship before the end of their student visa it's what i call the golden window where the employer does not need to pay the immigration skills charge so that could save between one to five thousand pounds on the hire Wow. And what is this golden period? Can you please explain? Yeah. So the golden period is either if you switch, like we discussed before, up to three months before the course end date of your student visa, or if you switch to skilled worker after your course finishes, but before your student visa ends. Oh, wow. So that means a student needs to be very proactively be looking for a job and almost aiming to have something within that period or just before that period? It's certainly a significant selling point. So I get lots of messages from people. So I get questions, I get inquiries, but I also get people giving me feedback. So, you know, someone might come and get in touch with me and say, thank you so much for your advice. I've got my visa. And I've had people come back to me who've seen my content about the golden window and who have said, thank you for your advice. I spoke with my employer they've saved money and I get the sponsorship. So it's win-win. Oh, lovely. And for all those folks who are wondering where would they get this expert advice, Adam uh, speaks about uh, visa and immigration extensively on LinkedIn. So do follow him over LinkedIn. I would drop his LinkedIn link in the description below. So um, previously, Adam, uh, for the skill shortage list, all those occupations that were included in skill shortage list, they were in demand. But now what I've heard is the skill shortage occupation list is being scrapped. So what is that about? Now, which skills slash occupations would almost be in demand in the UK? Yeah, so you're right. So the shortage occupation list is being scrapped. And I suspect that it will be scrapped along with the new immigration salary threshold coming in in April. Now it's being replaced by something called the immigration salary list. So the immigration salary list is a reduced number of jobs. So the shortage list had 37 jobs on it. Now we're only dealing with 21. Now the positive about the immigration salary list is it will offer some discounts on salaries for certain roles. So but for all those folks who have already celebrated their getting a job in the UK, international job seekers, they have a skilled worker visa, should they be worried about any further changes coming? Would the changes be coming for them as well or just for the new folks? So we've been given some assurances, so some guarantees from the government that anybody who's on a skilled worker visa already or anyone who makes a valid application for a skilled worker visa before the date the rule changes, they will be effectively protected from a lot of these big changes. Now, the government had haven't explained exactly what that will look like, but this is what the government call transitional provisions. So it's basically in place to try and protect and help the people who are already 
in the immigration system and they're already moving forward on a visa. I, I hope that's that turns out to be a good news for the existing folks. <laughs> well, it's it's certainly better than having to apply after the rule change, that's for sure. That's true. That's true. And if an international student want to start a business in the UK, how feasible is it? Is there a different visa for it? So there's a couple of options, really, in terms of starting a business in the UK. So the one main dedicated business visa is called the Innovator Founder Visa. Now, that visa is an endorsement based visa. So what that means is, is that the government have entrusted three private companies to vet applications in order to get the visa. And a big part of the application is a business plan, a robust business plan. And there's three criteria that they want candidates to meet when they apply. They want to know if the business is innovative, so if it shows innov innovation. They want to know if it's scalable, so they want to know if the business is going to grow. And they want to know if it's viable, whether they can actually pay the overheads and support themselves while they're starting. So that's the first one. And then the other option is the sort of so-called self-sponsorship route. Now, there's a couple of ways to go about this. The first one is perhaps starting a business with a trusted business partner who either has ILR or British citizenship or settled status, any kind of visa without an expiry in the UK. Set up a business with them and that trusted business partner takes care of the license and is able to sponsor the individual to work on a visa and to start that business. The the other way to potentially do it is hiring someone to work with you who is a settled person in the UK and who can support you in building your business, who can also be the auth what's called the authorizing officer for the license. The authorizing officer is the person who's ultimately responsible for the license to the company. And that way, they, the company can issue a certificate of sponsorship and sponsor you. So there's no threshold to the scalability in terms of revenue or your self salary. There's no threshold as such. When it comes to the type of self sponsorship that I'm referring to, it's still under the skilled worker route. So any any restrictions or any rules to do with a skilled worker would also apply to anybody who's looking to do that. Obviously, that's quite a commitment to consider is starting a new business and being able to pay yourself quite a big salary from day one. Not many founders, as I'm sure you can also relate, have the luxury of being able to pay themselves a nice salary from day one. <laughs> so you you certainly, everything has to line up quite well. And I would imagine it has to be quite well funded, whether that's personal savings or whether that's, you know, whether that's VC or whether that's some other support from other, some other stream. So what happens if an international job seeker got laid off in the UK? This is a very common question. So what normally happens when a worker gets laid off if they're on a visa is that their employer will need to notify the Home Office that their employment has officially ended. Then, technically speaking, the Home Office need to notify the individual in writing, whether that's by email or by letter, that their visa is going to be cut short and there will be a grace period given with the letter and it's normally 60 days. Now, the interesting thing is, is it's not actually very common for individuals to get their letter. I was talking with somebody just the other day who they never got their letter. They were in the UK for a year, pretty much almost a year and they had enough time to secure another sponsored job because they never received the letter. Now, the one thing I would always recommend is make sure your details are up to date with UKVI. So your email address, your postal address, because once you get that letter, you want to make sure that you are able to receive it because you wouldn't want to accidentally stay here too long and break the law, or you wouldn't want to take a risk traveling and realize that your permission is finished and you cannot come back to the UK. That's a tricky situation because 60 days is not a lot of time. Uh, it's two months and generally UK recruitment is generally from two to three months and goes about nine months. So it yeah. could be a tricky situation for someone who got laid off. Yeah. And, and something else I would say, oftentimes employers will try to be as supportive as possible. So whether that's putting the individual on unpaid leave for a certain duration of time, so they're still employed um, and basically sort of putting off notifying the Home Office as much as legally possible in order to give as much time as possible to the individual. Got it. And thank you so much for uh, doing what you do, Adam. I keep following your content and I'm sure it's not just me. There's so, so 
host so many international students who are grateful for your content because understanding these complex stats is what makes them confident in looking out for a job in the UK and you yeah. are doing it and you are making it possible so thank you so much for doing it thank you so much for giving your time today and answering all the questions that we had today really appreciate it and for all those folks again who want to further get in touch with adam follow him on linkedin i'm going to share the link in the description and i'm going to see you in the next video don't forget to subscribe to my channel see you soon bye bye